to get started. Thanks, Kevin. So uh, I had a, a chance to kind of share some of the stuff in person in Boise, Minneapolis, DC, uh, Chicago, a couple of places over the last couple of weeks. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could share it with everybody who wasn't in one of those cities or couldn't make it to one of those events as well. And one of the things that kept coming up in those events was just that this is the most excited I've ever been about the work that we have in Guatemala. And to explain why to really tell that story is going to involve kind of going back to the core, to the origin of what the work was. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about is that we have a path to be able to impact millions upon millions of people in Guatemala, Central America, and eventually Africa. And why that matters so much to me and how it's going to happen and what we've achieved so far is what I'm going to be diving into over the course of about the next 15 minutes. And then, as always, we'll get to my favorite part, which is just talking about it. So if you have any questions, just write them down and we'll dive in as soon as we finish that piece of the call. But this is my story, how it began. I was 18. Uh, I was actually 17. I just started college. My best friend um, had met this kid named Fabian. And the kid had a 18-year-old dad, a 16-year-old mom who lived in Nicaragua. And Joe had become really close friends with the kid's dad, Alix, uh, when he was taking a gap year right before college. And to make a long story short, Joe got a call our third month of our freshman year that Alix had died in a fishing accident. And it basically left Fabian, this two-year-old kid, um, and his mom with nothing. They had a tiny piece of land that didn't have anything built on it. And Alex's dream had been to one day build a house. And he'd made this agreement with Joe that if someday he raised enough money to actually be able to get the building materials, that Joe would fly down and help them build that house and they'd have a house for their family. And Joe decided at 19 that he was going to go make that happen himself. And so I drove from Boise, Idaho, all the way to Ashland, Oregon, uh, picked up Joe and all of his high school friends, drove down south, left my uh, car with my grandparents who are on the call tonight. And um, we flew out from SFO all the way to Central America and built a home. And this photo will be up for less than half a second because I was really thin back then. That was me at 17. That journey kind of blossomed. And I think that what happened was as we were sitting there in that house, people started coming up to us and telling us their stories. And I think for anybody who's done this kind of work, this is a really common occurrence. Uh, we had families who came up and told us about a family member who needed a surgery and it was $400 for that surgery and it would save their life or other family members who didn't have a home and needed one as well. I mean, you get awash with this sea of need. And I think the question that really quickly baked in to me at this young age at 18 was, what could we do to actually make a big difference in poverty? Not just help a few people, not just give a few fish, but like actually change what was causing the amount of poverty that we saw. And so at 18, my next idea was, well, let's figure out how we can help grow the economy. And one of the big problems in the economy was, was fuel. And so we had this idea of helping every single community in Central America start their own biodiesel processor and start producing their own fuel. And so we borrowed a diesel bus. We designed a biodiesel processor system that even the poorest community could, could utilize. We strapped it all on that bus and we drove it from Walla Walla, Washington, as far down as the southern part of Nicaragua. Uh, built three biodiesel research centers, wrote a book on it. Um, the Nicaraguan government started making use of the technology, used this whole thing. But the problem was the economics didn't work out. It was still cheaper for the poorest of the poor to buy diesel rather than make their own biodiesel. And because of that, even the best intentions didn't really matter. And so I think that that was like a really, really core lesson really early on, that if we wanted to make a difference, it would have to be something that actually had an economic incentive for people that would help them make more income.
Fast forward two years later, and we started me and Web. I finished college, and at 21, I, I moved to Guatemala. And we wanted to figure out the techniques, the farming techniques that could make a difference for at least a million people. That was our whole goal. And I think that that goal really comes from those experiences earlier. We wanted to find something that was beneficial socially, beneficially in terms of people's health, could work with what people had which was their farm, and could do so in a way that would actually increase the income for the poorest of the poor. And so that first five years, we started trying everything. We started trying no-till. So we were teaching farmers to not plow their ground. And that worked great for sesame, or for corn, but farmers also had sesame crops, and that died in the no-till, which was a huge problem. We tried this crop called pigeon pea, which was fantastic. It was a free crop farmers could grow in between the row of their corn and sesame but it turned out farmers didn't like the taste. So that didn't work. We tried cooking classes to come up with new recipes to get that food into everybody's diet. But people just said, hey, it tastes a little bit different, even though the nutritional benefits are so great, not really into it. And so we had to scratch that idea. But the benefit of what we had was everything that we tried, let us know what would work and what would not work and why. Because every single thing we did was with small little test pots. It was data collected from farmer feedback, data on farmers' economic impacts, data on their situation. And then with all of that, we were able to actually hone down on a strategy that we actually thought had the legs to reach at least a couple million people. But to understand that, that new idea that we had, I think it's important to share what we learned. And what we learned is that even though Guatemala is the most malnourished country in the Western Hemisphere, it's the sixth most malnourished country in the world, that the reason for that malnutrition doesn't come from a lack of knowledge. It comes from how the economy is structured. It comes from how the pricing of food works. So if you're a mother and you have a dollar a day and you have five people to feed for three meals, 15 meals, how would you spend that dollar if your ingredients cost that much? 20 tortillas for 20 cents, an egg for 20 cents, or a couple spoonfuls of beans for 20 cents? The answer is pretty simple. You'd probably go with the tortillas. It's the only way to keep everybody fed. But the downside of this whole issue is that those tortillas don't have nutrition to allow kids to grow. And that's what leads to Guatemala having that super high rate of malnutrition. At the same time, the other thing that we saw was that all of these farmers are growing corn because it's the only crop that has a stable market. They can always sell it. They can always eat it. If no one wants to buy it, there's food that they can trade with people. But the problem is that the average farmer is only getting about 40 bushels per acre, which is pretty close to what we had in the United States before the Great Depression, before we used any agricultural technologies. For most of the million farmers who grow corn in Guatemala, that's not enough for them to feed their family for the year and also have enough corn to sell. And so the farmers end up trapped in this state of poverty where they don't have income, they don't have a nutritious source of food, and they're also you know, becoming more and more vulnerable to climate change. With that problematic in mind, a million farmers, not enough income, not enough nutrition, the big insight came for us was looking at the fact that within the natural world, within corn seeds in general, there's the ability to make them way better. Nature can help us come up with a type of corn that has more nutrition, that has the yields that will get farmers th those incomes that they want and that they need, and also that will make them more resilient to droughts and storms, which are becoming more and more common with climate change. And so this is the Simeon way above now, uh, 2022. This is what we do. We figure out how to make corn more nutritious. We figure out how to make seeds that are both high yielding and more nutritious, affordable enough that the poorest of the poor can buy them. And then we help other seed companies to copy our model and get governments to pay for it. That's it. In terms of the nutrition, our corn has more zinc, more iron, and a higher amount of protein quality, which are the three biggest deficiencies in the Guatemalan diet. This is what kids need and they normally don't get. And it turns out it's what corn normally doesn't have. 
and we can breed that into corn. And we have some amazing studies showing that if you just get kids to switch from normal corn to this biofortified kind of corn, which is not a GMO, although we have nothing against GMOs, um, you get bigger growth in terms of weight and height, which are the definitions of chronic and acute malnutrition. So these are the two biggest health problems that, that kids are facing, and we can fix both of them or make a big difference in both of them just by switching out the type of corn. How do we get farmers to use it? We have people who work in the fields day in, day out. There's about 12 of them who work with community leaders to plant the new seeds and then compare them to the seeds that farmers already have and bring their villages together to actually see those differences firsthand. And once we have all of that demand, then we switch to a very, to a supply chain solution. Essentially, we put really good margins on the seed. We sell it for below our normal cost and we make it the cheapest seed in the market with a good margin for the agro dealers, little stores where farmers buy seed and the distributors who stock those little stores. So essentially the logic behind everything we're doing is how do you help people make a little bit more money doing the right thing? And that's the way that you can actually get scale. The results have been fantastic and we're going to start getting into the part where I'm actually really, really excited and the stuff that I really want to be able to share with all of you, most of you who've been a part of this journey for years. We had 18,000 families who planted in 2022 throughout most of the corn growing regions of the country, all the red parts of Guatemala. And those 18,000 farmers fed 450,000 people with more nutritious corn. That's over 2 billion nutritious tortillas. So we're moving from just changing a few families to changing a whole system. One out of every 50 farming families in Guatemala using it. And we're getting close to now about 2% of the entire Guatemalan population eating it three times a day. Here's where I get excited. Here's the new stuff. So as I mentioned, there's about 850,000 farmers in Guatemala who normally don't buy seed. They're way too poor to buy good seeds. On average, they plant a little bit less than an acre and they get about $25 in net income per year, which is basically nothing. They're basically breaking even. We had 7.7 thousand families of those 850 who on average spent just $13 on seed. And that $13 investment on their part helped them make 221 additional dollars. This is randomly sampled data. This is random farmers from that group. This is not crazy projections based on like our test plots or all our internal data. This is what's actually happening to the farmers on the ground. There's also about 150,000 farmers in Guatemala who do buy seed, who have a little bit more money. They plant more, they earn a little bit more. And for them, we had 10,000 farmers in that group who actually saved money on seed. They spent less because our seed is so cheap and they earned about $100 more. But what's fantastic about this is combining it and averaging between the two. For every dollar that we received in donations in 2022, we were able to help a farmer make about $1.30 more in increased income. And our raise to just our goal is to get that to go up and up and up. We want it to be that not only is their nutrition benefit, not only is their climate change benefits, not only are there all the, the benefits going to other countries, but also just on a day in, day out, every dollar we receive in donation makes farmers more money than that dollar. That's our philanthropic rate of return. And we're seeing it increase year after year. Climate impacts have been super huge. Uh, this will be our first kind of Q and A. Can anybody guess which seed is ours and which seed is the most common commercial seed in Guatemala? And you can write it in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, shout out the answer. Corn on the left is yours. That is right. I mean, it's, it's not, you would, you would imagine that would be the case, but yeah. So this is our seed versus Guatemala's most common hybrid. And we're incredibly happy with that result. Um, 64% of farmers that we interviewed said that our seed is dramatically better than what they normally plant in terms of its ability to withstand storms and droughts. Only 6% said that they, they preferred their previous seed. And you can start to see why here with some of these photos. 
Sesigo means control or like the normal seed in Spanish and F3 is ours. And you can see the difference in the root systems on the left. On the top right, you can see the difference between, you know, how green the plants stay during periods of drought. And on the, the bottom right, you can see the difference also in terms of kind of uniformity of, of growth. So what's next? Our goal is to go from 18,000 families in 2022 to 32,000 families in 2023. That's basically one out of every 30 farming families in Guatemala. And it'll help us produce enough maize to feed almost a million people. We're gonna continue working with the Guatemalan government to actually get them to take over our model. And we have two new seed companies that are signing up. Some of those seed companies are actually bringing our model to El Salvador. So we will actually get more nutritious seed into our second country without having to have boots on the ground at all, which is one of our biggest goals. And it shows how we can expand to other countries. This rate is the thing that I'm super excited about. So $25 a seed for $130 of extra income for small farmers. That's what we've been working for forever. The chance for a tiny bit of help to actually go and make an exponential change for the poorest of the poor. And the last thing that I'll put out there is that we have a triple match. So if anybody goes to our website, and I think Gabby can put it in the chat and she'll send a follow-up email out there as well. Uh, we have two donors who are tripling every dollar that we receive um, in donations. If you've already donated, it's already gonna be tripled this year. Um, if you've donated in the last month or so, but we have about another week and a half. So feel free to go to semianueva.org. You can donate there and we'll put a link out as well. I do have one last story, but I want to put it on hold and answer some Q&A first, and then I'll, I'll jump straight to it. So any questions, everybody? Really quick story. This is one of my favorite experiences of the year. So in August, um, I was out in Northern Guatemala, which is a place I haven't spent a whole lot of time. Most of our early work was in Southern Guatemala. And we were working in one of the poorest regions in the country. Um, it's a place that used to be rainforest. Then a lot of more refugees moved there during the war, cleared some of that rainforest, built little houses and started calling it home. And so this is Oscar's family as four kids. You can see the home, dirt floor, planks that were cut straight from the forest, erected right there. And it's a one bedroom house for the kitchen, some beds, stuff is kind of like, you know, against the wall, there's some bags of corn in the back and that's their whole household. Yeah. What was crazy about visiting Oscar was his story. And so a year ago, he had a little bit of extra money. Um, he grows about an acre and a half of corn and he doesn't even own his own land. He has to rent it every year. And so he pays someone to give him access to land, grows a little bit of corn, sells part of it to pay for the, the rent. And then the rest is the food and the income for the family. And he was always getting about 20 quintales or about 2000 pounds of kind of net corn that he could use, which is just enough to feed the family. So there's basically no extra income and they'd have to find little odd jobs to be able to pay for clothes or school fees or anything like that. He had a tiny bit of extra money, like 10 extra dollars to his name. And the guy in the agro dealer where he'd normally buy a little bit of fertilizer for his corn crop told him there's this brand new seed that was really, really cheap. It was cheaper than all the other seeds. It's like some kind of special offer. And so he bought $10 worth of seed. That was it. And he planted it and he grew about $200 of extra corn. And he thought that was amazing. And he got a phone call because he left his phone number on one of our little lists. And a phone call from one of our field staff who said, hey, we don't have anybody in your region who can promote the corn. Would you be willing in doing a demo plot with us? We'll provide you more seed. We'll provide you a little bit of fertilizer so you can actually see how good this corn seed could be if you kind of gave it the stuff that it needs and if you got some help. And he didn't really know what to do. Spanish is his second language. His family is indigenous. Uh, it was a weird request. And so he said no. But we had nobody else in that region. So he got called back 
again and again and again. And our sales guy who's up there, who's a hoot, just wore him down until finally he's like, fine, fine, come see the farm at least and let's talk. And so our sales guy, Nelson, shows up. He's 27 year old uh, with a beat up pickup truck. And they agree to plant a full acre of our seed. And that full acre allows him to produce over $1,000 of additional corn. Now, here's what was super cool. His son, who you can see in this photo, basically said, Dad, look, I didn't get to go to school. School is expensive. You got three other kids who could go to school. But for them to go to school, we're going to need to make more money. And the thing is, there's a job working at a local plantation 20 minutes down the road. But we have no transportation. There's no way to get there. So I want you to take that $1,000 and I want you to buy a motorcycle. And if you buy the motorcycle, I'll go get the job. And that'll pay $250 every month. That will more than triple the $1,000 that we could have from just that, just what we'd spend on the motorcycle. And what was super cool is we heard this story and then we came and got to see that motorcycle and learn that he's off doing that job. And not only that, but they also, with their next harvest, bought a water pump because they've never had running water in their house. And so now they're able to pipe from the little lake that's down the road of ways and actually have water to do the dishes, to wash the laundry, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason that the story mattered to me so much is because I think it's really descriptive of what we're trying to do. If you think of the fact there's a million farming families just in Guatemala, there's 53 million farming families growing corn in Africa and Central America between the two places, which is a lot of families. Every one of them has this potential. Every one of them, if we can get them the right seeds, the right tools, can make a whole bunch of money and unlock their potential and then go do a bunch of other things. And so imagine just kind of raising the tides of all of the boats. That's really what we're trying to do. And I think that's the reason that I'm so excited. And the thing I'd want to kind of close this call with is that what you all have done, because so many of you have been supporters, whether at the very beginning or more recently, or in the case of you know some folks in this call just in the last week, is give us the ability to develop a solution that can scale that can take this story from Oscar's family and go multiply it out, not just 18,000 times like we did this year, but 32,000 times next year, 50,000, 100,000, millions of times. That's the goal, is to actually put a real big old dent in the universe for some of the people who need it the most. So thank you guys so much for coming to our call. Um, feel free to donate. Your, match, or your donation will get tripled. And if you have any other questions or thoughts, um, feel free to shoot me or Gabby an email. And with that, I think we can call it a night. And thank you all so much for coming.